Yes. You need, I mean, you need graph chi actually. But, uh, I mean, you can. So, graph chi will explain what it is, but what are the differences? They're more or less the same. Like uh, from Chihuahua. Like this graph in Labrador, and that is a graph in Chihuahua, the small version. CHI. CHI. Okay. Friday, and it's Christmas, and unfortunately, we don't know how to make these things. I hate that. I just we try a different cable. Okay. Okay. Hello. You don't have to build everything. So it doesn't want to. Hello? Uh, we don't have audio, audio. Okay, and we need video too. Okay. Hello there. So we have uh, all the Can everybody hear us? Oops. Hello. Can you hear us? Cool. So Raz can hear us. I believe the video is good. Ah, oh no. Unfortunately, this thing doesn't want to connect to projector I wonder if anybody knows how to make windows connect to a projector it, this thing should work but it doesn't and I did try this connect to a projector and I did reboot everything so it's fine. We're only two, four, five here. You can just all connect to WebEx. I was thinking that maybe it would be a better idea if um, you know we had a projector here, but you'll see it through WebEx. So maybe I can turn the lights on. So hello, everybody. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people sign up, then they, then they don't show up. I, I guess it's a very common thing on. Hmm? You do the other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you want to connect? Huh? No. Oh, okay. You might. Oh, okay. Well, okay. <laughs> you can also get. Um, you, if you want more. The what? 
the wire probably it's not connected that's why somebody has to just plug it on the wall you to put it on the wall okay you know these things happen in a live program as <laughs> see so this is we promised five classes eventually we did four oh hello join us uh, uh you know unfortunately it's also difficult for me because i i have to leave early these days so that was an exception today to to be able to host that uh always creative uh so you know we did get a flavor of r uh, unfortunately, we never managed to run everything full scale on our Hadoop. Uh, well, um, you know, there were some technical difficulties. I think most of you were at least able to replicate what we discussed in class. Now, we recommend that you buy a MapR subscription from uh, Brad here, who works for MapR. And uh, you can you also send this document you sent me about MapR and uh, Hadoop. So they've also, yeah. Yeah, I have it. I'll just, I'm not sure if I, I'll remember it. Okay, I'll do it. Yeah, yeah, I remember you told me. No, I think it's fine if, you know, any of you want to install it on a cluster. You know, you're also the cloud. MapR has a, a, a faster implementation of uh, HDFS. Uh, it's probably going to be faster and more stable over there. Uh, in the next semester, and we're going to see how we're going to do that, because I'm becoming more and more busy, uh, we're going to use Python and NumPy, uh, and uh, we're going to use the Mortar Data. I think I posted this website. Mortar Data is a, a very easy, like we're going to bypass all this uh, Hadoop installation. Basically, you submit your um, uh, MapReduce ta Map tasks with either Pig or uh, Python. And you just give your Amazon credentials, and it does everything for you to launch the cluster. Uh, now, as you saw on the, it was already announced in the um, meetup uh, semester two syllabus that we're going to work on the winning competition, winning solution, or second winning solution of the KDD Cup 2012 which was supposed to do recommendations on Twitter, if I remember correctly. Now, it just happened that I got this nice blog post from my friend Danny Bixon, who is the project manager of GraphLab, where coincidentally he was working on the airline data set. And, um, you know, we ran our regression, we saw the problem, the scalability, all these things. And, uh, you know, based on this paper, it's called Factorization Machines, he presented the solution that was um, uh, quite innovative, I think. Uh, a solution that other people in the industry have also made my comments on. Uh, it's on, it's on, the, on, the, on the blog. Uh, it's an interesting trend where basically you use similar stuff uh, for recommendations, recommendation engines to do um, forecasting prediction. And um, it makes a nice a connection between traditional linear regression and stuff that we've talked in this class with uh, what people are using in these uh, very sexy high-tech uh, companies like Netflix and Yahoo. So let me, do you have a WebEx installed? No? Do you want to go come this way? Because unfortunately our projector doesn't work because I'm going to do everything from WebEx. Why don't you? You want to come and sit next to me? So let me jump directly. Like I, I know that unfortunately most of you have, didn't have the time to install GraphKai on, or GraphLab, and uh, because we have only about an hour here, I don't want to spend time. I mean, you can you feel free as I'm talking to try to install like follow the instructions from Danny Bixon. Uh, the Gen SGD, I think it's called Gen SGD. It's it's on the on the use here here. I think it's called collaborative filtering. Good, yeah, collaborative filtering, Gen SGD. 
So, oh, hi, Moses, how are you? A few words about, um, uh, let's first talk about the model. It's very simple and I can explain this to you and then we'll talk about the GraphLab uh, details and why I'm a big fan of GraphLab and I believe that it's going to somehow dominate large-scale machine learning. And uh, we might actually see um, Hadoop adopting some of it. So it is, I, don't, I can't predict what's going to happen. You know, Hadoop has almost, you know, has several other amenities, like it's a database, transform data transformations. It has a lot of things inside the stack, okay? So, but I think there is a way to implement uh, the Hadoop scheduler under YARN. Yes. Uh, I'm not. Sure. I don't think they implement. I think yes. You actually need MPI. I think in their implementation they have MPI. We'll discuss it there. The, the key thing is to. It looks a lot like Erlang, you know, or Scala actors. If you can implement something like that under, um, yeah, ship the messages and all these things, then you. And I think somebody will do it at some point. So anyway, let's go back to our regression problem, the airline data set. You remember we're trying to predict the delay as a linear combination of several factors. Do you need the um, whatever wire? Mm. Then we do have extra ones. Is it plugged into the wall? Did you plug it in? Yeah. So you need, can you just grab a cable from there? There's an extra Ethernet cable. Oh, there's one on the wall? Oh, okay. Just plug this in behind you. Uh, or no, there is one. Okay. So, if you remember, that was our initial model, and um, you know we identified that it, it might have some restrictions, which is we can only have a linear combination of factors, and we did talk actually that we might want it to augment the model okay, with what we call the interactions. Do you remember that? In other words, we would enter in some terms before others. Yes, so we would term this. You know, typically, if you add interactions, regression becomes, you know, it's a more complex model. It can complex um, extra nonlinearities. And you can keep adding, you know, even more, let's call that Y prime, which is actually here you need a double sum, and here you need a triple sum. Now, if you remember, one of the factors we had was um, cities, origin, and destination, and we had 127 origins and destinations. So basically, if we wanted to take the interactions, all possible interactions are in the matrix, which is 127 by 127. This is approximately 10,000 uh, coefficients extra that we have to to the model. And this is probably a simple problem, because if you go to movies and users and uh, text, this can easily be, you know, double the interaction. Like, you can have one million terms, and if you want to take all interactions, it can become a billion. Where are we getting the, the coefficient and the variables? Are, are we combining our variables together? So we're combining our variables. Like, before you would have, you know, a model that was had only these linear terms, A1, X1. Yeah, so then you can X1 times X2. Exactly. So next time, so you augment now. You have so so if you have n 
So if you have n, you know, terms, n factors, how many interactions do you have? Like this wij will be, so the whole matrix is n square, but it's symmetric. So what is the exact number you would need? It would be, it wouldn't be n square over 2. Actually, it would be approximately that, okay, because this matrix is symmetric. So you need only the upper half or the lower half. Now, the problem is that this is becoming too big. Although most of them can be zero, you know, when you're training, still, while you are training, you know, you have to start with something non-zero to end up with zero. Plus, there's another problem that uh, there might be interactions that you don't have them in your training data. So you would never find what is, um, you know, a flight between uh, Detroit and Athens, Georgia. But in, you might see that in the future. Or, for example, you might not see an interaction between a specific user and a specific movie. It never happened before. Or this specific movie has very little interactions. So here is the innovation that uh, the factorization machine machines introduces. Let's open a new whiteboard. Let's rewrite that. I write it in a more condensed form. Again, any of you who wants to um, get a detailed view, and because I know there are some people like Rad that uh, or VJ who have experience with these things and want to read the full paper, if you go to the blog post, there is uh, the full paper over there, and you can feel free to take a look at it. Now, now Now, imagine that so we need to condense this WIJ. It doesn't have to be 10 million. So we have to find a way to compress this matrix. So the only requirement for this matrix is that it's symmetric, OK? Now, does anybody know how we can approximate a matrix if anybody has done linear algebra like if you have a symmetric matrix or can you add any restrictions to make that you know more compressed so the idea is to write this matrix and this is the beauty of factorization as this times this so this, let's call this W matrix, and then we call this matrix V, and this is V transpose. Sorry. Does anybody understand the inner product, like the product between two matrices? Like, if you want to compute this element, you have to multiply this row with this column. Let's say if you want to, you know, if you want to find this element, you find which one is the corresponding row here, this one, and which is the corresponding column somewhere towards the end. So you take the inner product of this column and this row. You can come and sit behind me, okay? And you'll find it. So now, what is the gain? This matrix is almost n square. Actually, the right one is n times n plus one over two that you need. And this one is, let's say, you pick an order k. So this is n times k, and this is k times n. So basically now, your um, space complexity is 2 times n times k. So n can be a million, and k, you feel free to get your chair to go that way, OK? So k is typically something between 10 to 100. You won't see something more than that. So like, let's see the, the savings. If you had uh, a 1,000 factors, you know, you would need 10 to the 6 almost, and this one you would need um, 10 to the 4th, let's say. Okay, so it's two orders of magnitude, and as you can see, this grows quadratically, this grows linearly in, t in terms of n, so it's much more efficient. So what did you do right now? So obviously, since we compressed the matrix, what is the, the basic principle? 
like, is this a freelance? Am I, are we losing anything? And the, the answer is like, in the beginning, we had n square coefficients. And now we said, okay, now instead of using n square, we're going to use n times k. So we're using a less complex model. So we must have lost something in complexity. And what is this? Now, in the beginning, as I told you, this matrix, the only requirement that is, that was that it has to be symmetric. Okay. Now, this matrix will have to be something what we call positive semi-definite. So we got matrices, symmetric matrices, positive semi-definite matrices. You know, if you take the superset, so let me plot that here. So you have the set of real matrices. And then you have a subset of that, which is symmetric matrices. And then you have a small subset, which is positive PSD, as we call them, which is fine. You know, it's a reasonable assumption to make. Uh, as you can see, it, you know, we're not losing that much. It's still like a huge space. It's not that you're constraining your space a lot. So basically, let's go and see how we write this equation. So basically, what we said right here is that this WIJ would be represented by the dot product of VI, VJ. And by the way, we have VJ on the line. VJ is also an Indian name. So we can, uh, OK, so OK, somebody commented. So let's get the composition, yes. So basically, Brian said, uh, uh, so Brian seems to be very strong in math. Uh, in he, been doing all the homeworks too. So it's like, so let's keep the composition with the one difference though. So does anybody know or have ever heard of the Toleski decomposition? So let me rewrite the equation as I want it, uh, as I want, and then I'll explain what's the difference between Toleski decomposition. Um, I suggest, Brian, next time you have a question, because as I said, with the Atma, my eye doesn't catch it, just feel free to go and write on the whiteboard so I can see it. So basically, again, does everybody understand what the inner product is? Do we know that? You remember that, Brad? From uh, It's been a long time. Let me repeat what the, the inner product is. So if you have two vectors, you know, V1, V2, V3, V4, and then you have another vector, S, let's say this is V, and this is or, yeah, and this is S1, S2, S3, S4. The dot product of V comma S, which is also symmetric, is will be the same as S, is equal to you know V1 times S1 plus V2, S2 plus V3, S3 plus V4. S4. So in general, sigma vi si. Okay. Now, because you're a database person, to make it um, uh, more easy for you, it's just a, a, a join and aggregation. So imagine that this was, uh, you know, a table with, uh, you know, and, and it had a key. This is the first element, to the second element, third element, fourth element, and this is another table. So you do a join on the key, and the result, you take the multiply and sum, OK? It looks like a, a lot. Um, OK, so now what we know, you know, nothing. So, so far, we haven't really said anything. Uh, I just want to point out that you know, effective machine learning doesn't really have super complex mathematics, except for some very special cases. So, so far, we, I don't think we've said anything um, super complex. All we said is that. This WIJ, we're going to replace it with, again, I'm writing the model. Now, Sorry for my calligraphics, it's not great. And that has a huge call, it's like a huge gain right now. So we were so we're able to use interaction. Now if somebody wants to uh, to use terms 
that they have three or four or five. Uh, there are other ways to do that. You can read the paper, but you kind of like follow the same um, the same way. Okay. Now you're using tensors and you're approximating them. But it turns out that the complexity grows linearly. Okay. Now let's back to the factorization that. Uh, Brian pointed out just because he made this asked this question. So in general, we know that every positive semi-definite matrix. You no, know, again we said it's symmetric and blah blah blah. So it has a factorization of a lower triangular, sorry, times. A Uh, the transpose of that. Okay, now uh, take a look at the, but there's a big distinction on that, which is, so basically we use Cholesky factorization uh, just like uh, in, in, in informally, that when you're having a, a, a linear system which is n by n, and the matrix happens to be positive semi-definite, then you use Cholesky factorization. Like remember, for example, when I told you that you know, when we have linear regression, if we write it in matrix form, this is y, it's equal a times x. And in order to solve you, you need to compute the a, a transpose. OK. So this is a positive semi-definite matrix, positive definite. You remember that, uh, Amber? No? No. Yeah. OK. Uh, anyway, so you need to, to, you need to, to, to solve the matrix like that. So typically, you use Cholesky factorization, which produces these diagonal, diagonal matrices, and um, uh, everybody is uh, super happy. You know, it, it runs fast, it's very stable, it has several advantages. The problem now that this in Cholesky factorization, you're not saving anything in memory, because you know, again, how many elements did you have over here? You had n square over two because it was symmetric, and here again you have n square over two. This is Sorry, this is zero. So you're not saving anything. Uh, it's kind of like an old, uh, an old style thing. So are we okay so far? Is it? Are, are you with me? Do we have any questions? Now, um, yeah. I know we're, I know we're using uh, data compression, but going back to the original formula, when you added terms to discover your new features, and you said, did you ever? I mean, is this still, are we still linear? Can we still call this linear regression? If we're, do we ever, uh, I guess my question is, do we ever actually combine one feature times itself? In which case, are we still linear? So the model, in terms of axis, it's linear. Like when you, when you will have to evaluate it, let's go back here. And still have it. In, so when you're going to evaluate here, if you get a new data point where it has, you know, X A, you know, uh, city origin and temperature and uh, aeroplane brand and blah, 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 then you will put it on this formula. You will have to evaluate, though, this coefficient on the fly. So that's the big difference right now, is that in the original model, we would have pre-computed all Ws, and when we would want to evaluate a new, um, you know, point, we would just, you know, get from a hash table or from memory all the coefficients a i and w i j and do the multiplication so everything will already be computed here we compute a compressed version of the matrix and every time we need the w i j we have to compute it on the fly okay this computation is ridiculous like very simple but so if you want you can pre compute everything but you don't want to pre compute everything because it's, okay that's that's the gain you are having. You are uh, you know saving memory, which it's it's huge right now, by replacing your coefficient with a function. So your coefficient now, w, sorry, is a function of i comma j, and this function depends on v. You pre-calculated v. Hmm? No, we'll discuss about actors. It's close, not very far. So the actors are coming in um, 
in training the set. So now, you know, I'm not going to talk about how we, or maybe I should talk about how we train this model. Like basically, the way you train this model, you remember, I mean, how did we train regression? Like we remember in regression, in machine learning in general, you just take the, the, the mean square error. So you take this. You take the sum over all your training points, and you're trying to minimize it. OK? Now, this is not a linear problem anymore. So the truth is that you know in linear regression, we had a specific way to compute it. It was, uh, you know, we had a unique global optimum. In order to train that now, you need to employ other methods of non-convex optimization. They're described. They're not that difficult. You can describe them in the paper, and, um, and 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 you can solve it. Now let's see some examples of how. So this is, you know, for the airline data set. Now I talked about factorization and recommendation engines. So you're actually going the opposite way from the blog. The blog invented, or the user invented this method over here, Stephen Rendell, which, by the way, he became a professor and he has some open machine learning positions. If any of you wants to do a, a PhD in Germany, I think he's in Germany. Uh, so basically, he invented that in order to win a recommendation problem. And then Danny Bixon said, oh, let's you know, replace regression. It's error uh, minute in predicting the. Okay. I don't know. I might have to pick it up later. Plus my two-minute model in predicting on the training data. So like he started with five minutes, uh, 35 minutes, and then he took it down to. And, 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 and so let's go to the recommendation problem, and we'll see what are the advantages. Why is that rated in minutes and not accuracy or, or actual? Well, you, you, you can get it down. But I think, you know, in, in real world, if you can predict the delay of the fly within two minutes, you are pretty well, you know. If you think that the average flight is like two or three hours, it's it's a very small error. Do you, do you know what the actual error was? Because to me, in the world of the internet, we care about how accurate it's going to be, like our actual prediction, mm -hmm. as opposed to, and it would be important to do it online, especially for a paper. Online. So, so he has for for his recommendations. So in this blog post, he has one for the airline data set, and he has one for uh, the Twitter recommendation, whatever this is, uh, and you know he. He shows like by adding extra components how uh, you know how fast it converges and how much you reduce your error. So in the typical Netflix problem recommendation, you have a matrix which is you know users and movies. Okay. So what you do over here is, you know, user Amber goes and raids Gladiator with three, gives five stars to Sense and Sensibility. Angelo goes and gives, you know, five stars to Terminator, two stars to uh, Eternal Sunshine of a Spotless Mind, and whatever, you know, rate movies. So this is a matrix now. We call that matrix. V. Okay. Now, typically, what you do in uh, uh, in in the recommendation engine, you take this V and you decompose to a W times H. So again, you compress this matrix with W. I actually, sorry, we I can forget. I forget what, how we. I think this is a W matrix and this is V times. I can remember right now. I forgot the term. Doesn't matter. Whatever you want. That's, but be careful that these matrices now are different, you know. This can be one million, and this is, in the Netflix competition, I think it was, you know, 500K, doesn't matter, and this was like 17K movies, okay? So you do this factorization, 
And then when you're asking, okay, based on this, I want to make recommendations. So somebody is asking, do you think that, um, you know, Noir would be interested in uh, Sherlock Holmes that he hasn't seen over here? So Noir is user number 3,007868. This is number 10,000 movie. So I take this particular column. I take the dot product with this particular column. Okay. I take the dot product and it gives me 0.2 stars. So I say Noir, I think if you see that movie, you will get 6.2. So basically what Mahout does, it's a linear scan. So it will take Noir as a column and we'll take all the dot products with all the movies, we'll find the ones that have the highest stars and we'll give it to you. It will use a nice map reduced to distribute these computations. Unfortunately, when it has to do that for a million users, it has to do this task a million times. There are other papers and other techniques how you do fast. This is where I specialize, do that fast, okay? Um, so is that, you know, this is more or less how recommendation engine works. And now when Amazon, wants to find out similar products, it will just go, let's say, to this particular book, and it will take the dot product with every other book. It will find the ones that are the closest. So when you go, anybody who lands on this page, it will say, okay, you read uh, R in action. What about reading you know, our mm, cookbook? Okay, so this is exactly how uh, recommendation engines work. Now, let's see how this relates. So basically, in order to solve this problem, you minimize this this norm. So you take you know, overall users, this thing, and you're trying to minimize, you get this factorization. Now, let's see, is everybody with me down there, over there? So what happened? We don't have more, okay, more whiteboard. Now, let's go back to our model. Now, imagine that uh, xi, where the i ranges from uh, zero to a million is the users. Okay, this corresponds to users. And when you take x i from one million to one point one million corresponds to movies. So I'm saying that the rating of the movie is a linear combination, okay, of who the user is, so i is from 0 to 1 million, plus 1 million to 1.1 million. So basically this has to do with something like the average recommendation of the user, because this matrix is sort of biased. Some users tend to give very high recommendations and some others tend to be more conservative. So you're correcting for that. And then I'm taking Okay. So this is the interaction between thank you very much for the Windia player. No. So okay, and we put here the Y I J. Okay. So basically, these are the interactions between uh, uh, user and movie. So every time we present a movie, you know, we say this is, you know, uh, Brad. So this is a training set. Every training set is Brad. And this is a particular movie, uh, Gladiator. And he gave a star, you know, three stars. And this is, you know, Brad times gladiator. That means that this xi represents Brad as a generic profile. No. This term represents gladiator as a movie. And this one represents the combination of Brad and gladiator. Okay. Is that also controlling the movie and the bias of that? I mean, you talked about the user bias. But the yeah, yeah, that's the user bias, the gladiator. Is the gladiator. Okay, the user bias. And actually, uh, we're not going to talk, I don't want to make it too heavy, so we have more stuff to talk about in, in the next semester. Uh, the, the innovation of the winning competition was that, um, you know, you also introduced time that you kind of like your recommendation habit changes over time. So basically, these terms also vary over time. So you would have to add a component about when this was. 
yeah, it's a memory function that goes exactly something like that. So, so this is basically, you know, how we can see, you know, we use the same formula that we used before for uh, um, the airplane data set so was a pure regression problem. So it, it turns out that when you run this factorization, you know, again, this Wij, it will be the inner product of Vi comma Vj. So basically, you will come with a matrix Vi that up to here is, you know, this part represents the users and this part represents the movie. So if we go back, you know, remember when we, we had two matrices that now these two matrices are stuck together. So you see the equivalence, okay? So now, if you want to find similarity between movies, you just take dot products between them. If you want to find similarities between users, dot products between them. If you want to make, a, you know, basically, if you want to make a prediction now, where you're saying, okay, this is the coefficient for Brad and uh, the English patient, and then you have WIWJ, you can make a forecasting. It turns out this is a very uh, nice model. Now, Let's move forward. Now, the problem is that we were only able to use information about Brad or whatever, users and movies. But in order to improve your recommendations, you want to use more factors, like is he a male or a female? Does he live in Atlanta? Does the movie have Kevin Bacon inside? All these things, okay? So this is, remember in the regression, like let's go back, in the regression, these factors over here, they used to have, you know, we put everything inside. So we put, um, you know, city, origin, destination, uh, flight number, weather, blah, blah, blah. So in the same way, and that's the, uh, the nice thing that Danny presents in his blog post, is that when you're having a problem, when you're trying to fuse information from several aspects, you know, it's perfectly fine. You just go to this matrix, and you know, you put user here, and then here you can put movies, you can put uh, gender, demographics, textual information, uh, you know, maybe the summary of the movie, actors, anything you want. You do the same factorization, nothing is changing. Now, you go again back here, and we jump somewhere. Maybe I deleted something. I must have deleted. Hmm? So. Yeah, I don't know. Must. Uh, ah, okay, yeah, right. I'm not very, very good with computers. So, so uh, yeah, anyway, where's the new one? So you keep adding more terms here, you're taking the interactions. Do you want to take the interactions between, uh, so where was that? Come on, anyway, let's add a new one. You want to take more inter, so where's the latest matrix that I plotted? Okay, okay. I think it was this one. No. There was another one, I can't find it right now. Okay, here it is. So, you use the same model. You can throw more information. That's uh, the beauty of it. Now, if you want now, you know, we discussed before where we had interactions xi, xj. You can make this more complex. Adding more complexity will improve the uh, the accuracy of your model, but you will have to do a little bit more work. Uh, now, another thing that we didn't talk is that, you know, we're having this V matrix over here, you know, VI, and all these sigmas. This here. Um, yeah. You also, you know, you, you don't really need to know that. We'll talk that. Again, this is a teaser for next semester to convince you to come again. Uh, and you can add the regularization term where you're taking the the norm of v. It can be the be the 
L2 norm or it can be the L1 norm. So basically what you're trying to do is, you remember, does anybody remember what regularization is and why we were using it? So we are trying to Zero, yeah, to zero. Yeah, so we want to, basically we still want to, because you, you remember, we are looking for the simplest model. So we would do cross-validation and try to uh, push coefficients to zero as possible as we can. Now, let's talk a little bit about GraphLab, and uh, it's already close to 10 to 5. So what is the beauty of GraphLab and why we like it? So graph is an, kind of like an agent-based system. So basically, you define, you know, a graph of your data, where basically, you know, this is a user and this is a movie. And, and this is a user here and this is a movie. User, movie. So. Let me make it a little bit simpler. Let's talk only about users and not movies to make it even simpler. So these are users. These users are implicitly connected through the movies that they, the common movies they have rated, okay? Whatever. Now, each user is an actor. So each user is building his own recommendation engine. So, it's, so this user is, has, which variable has, you know, it has the variable vi, let's say, that you see the user. And then he has a couple of other variables, vj, you know, v, so let's say that this is v1 and this is v10, v11, v12, which is movies that he has rated. And again, this is user v2, and this user v2 may also have the um, v10, which is the component of the specific movie. So basically what is happening is that this user, yeah. So, sorry, the v10 and... Let me use the... My understanding the v2 is let's say the user... Okay, okay, let me use, it, let me use a different, uh, because it will make it... Uh, so those are the inputs, so let's say v2 represents the agent, and then his inputs into the system that we know for sure. So let, let's call V the users and me M the movie. So this one has rated movie M1, M2. So this is M1. This is M2. Okay. And this is user V2. V3. V4. And this is movie M4. Okay. And this. Uh, no, you can have multiple edges though. You know, so yeah, you can actually, you're right, you can have multiple movies on the same way. Now, what is happening is that this user is trying to run a recommendation engine on his own. So basically, it's trying to estimate the V1, M1, M M2 vectors. But the same vector also exists over here. So what's happening is that they run their optimization, and once they think they've made some progress, they send that to their neighbors. And th their neighbors are doing the same. Okay, so every time they solve something, they send the update to their users. So they work completely independently. Okay, so these, all these things are running asynchronously and they are exchanging messages asynchronously. With Hadoop or MapReduce, what we would do is that, you know, we would all compute something and we'll all make a global update, while these ones are making local updates. And let me give you a simpler example to understand. Imagine that we wanted to compute, does anybody here know how PageRank works? Again, don't get frustrated. We don't have that much time. We'll explain GraphLab in depth in the next semester. So in the, in the page rank case where you have web pages, at each step, you know, you start with some random, uh, you know, page ranks P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6. So at each stage, I compute, I take my page rank, I, I divide it by the number of my outgoing 
um, links and I pass it to my neighbors. And the neighbors do the same. So every time I'm recomputing my, so that's what I'm doing here. I'm recomputing, I'm computing my, I start with something and I pass it to my neighbors. The neighbors do the same asynchronously. So every time something new comes to me, I repeat the process. And every time I check, has my page rank changed a lot? If it hasn't, it means I have converged. I'm not transmitting anything. So in the beginning, everybody will start passing messages, but very quickly, you know, these parts of the graph will convert because they don't have many links, but this graph of the part of the graph, which is a click, will need more time to convert. It's more complex. So basically what's going to happen in the beginning, every node will start broadcasting a message, but maybe after two or three messages they exchange, this one will convert, while this one will continue working. So basically the asynchrony over here is that your uh, um, resources are automatically distributed in a more efficient way. Okay? So imagine we're having, you know, imagine like think about that in your company. You are having a project where you have developers being involved, you have admin people being involved, and you have the secretaries. Okay. If you have to have a meeting every time somebody has progress, then it will be a disaster. You know, you have to block each other. Like you have to wait. Very quickly, after the first week, the secretaries will have converged. The developers will be a mess. The managers will be better, you know, whatever. So if you had to go to your, like, think about how you work in your team. You give, you know, each of you is getting a part of the problem to do, and you do asynchronous updates. Okay, this is the progress I have, or can you send me this? If you have to synchronize every, you know, one hour, then obviously you're going to be very slow. So that's the, uh, the beauty of GraphLab. Now, the difference between GraphLab and GraphKai, again, GraphLab is Graph Labrador, and if you see the website, it has a Labrador, and GraphKai is the Tiawa, the small one. <laughs> and um, GraphLab was uh, developed first, and then, um, but GraphLab is everything in memory, so GraphKai is using uh, a pager, so it can page things into uh, a disk. I think GraphLab is also distributed, but I think GraphKai is not distributed yet. But because it, you know, it doesn't have any memory limit, it can still handle. Uh, I encourage you to visit the GraphLab website, and I, I'm actually going to post the presentation of the GraphLab workshop that I participated. And uh, you can see the benchmarks are like GraphLab can run the, the benchmark, the, the page rank, uh, you know, about a thousand times faster than, um, you know, Hadoop. You know, you will see that with Hadoop, it will take, you know, 1,400 machines. I'm not trying to disadvertise your business, okay? <laughs> take that. Or Pregel, you know, they will, and then the other one will use only 100 machines and run it 1,000 times faster. So how does it compare against Pregel? Oh, it's much faster. Because Pre Pregel is like synchronous. It's a bulk synchronous model, BHP, bulk synchronous parallelization, yeah, parallel. So GraphKai now, they all, the reason why they did that was that, um, you know, GraphKai initially was running on a, 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 an Apple Mini that has a solid state drive. So they did some optimizations for paging. So, you know, you can take advantage of that and, and be quite fast. You know, that's, uh, that was the, the, the advantage of, of, I think they are investing a lot of time on GraphKai and they have some toolboxes for visualization right now. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting project. You can see, like I can give you another example, and that will be the last one because I have to go. Like imagine now you had a, a disconnected graph, okay? Which is something very common Angular in the IP DNS. So the domain name IP graph is a highly disconnected graph. Like you have several IPs to the same domain name, or you know this, and then the same domain name points to some other IPs, but it's very disconnected. Now, if you want to identify these disconnected components. How do you do it? You start and you, you know, you initialize your graph by going through every node and you assign a number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. And now you set the rule. So you set the very, you know, with GraphLab, you said, it's, again, it's like Erlang, you set a very local rule. And you say, look at your neighbors, look at their ID, and if their ID is higher than yours, 
just get theirs. Or you know, you can do that with minimum or maximum. So basically, what is going to happen over here, you know, one would look at its neighbor will be two, so this will become two. Then two will look at its neighbor, will see that four, it will become four. In the next iteration, the four will pro be propagated over here. So basically, with this rule, eventually all these nodes will get four, 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 four. Here, I think the maximum is 11. And you know, it, that's completely asynchronous. You say, every time you have something new, because for example, you know, after the first iteration, all of them will get four. They, they won't really need to do that again. This one will need two iterations. So with a bulk synchronous model, you will have to update all, the, all these nodes twice, okay? While with a synchronous model, all this will take one iteration and this will only take two. So you save CPU time. So basically, after you finish this rule, this will be 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11. And this will be 14, 14, 14. And this will be 17, 17, 17. Let's just do that. That's the, the, the objective function's overall score. So the objective function here is to identify these connecting components. Okay. And you're just saying, just pick from your neighbors the maximum ID. Propagate the maximum ID. So basically, eventually you will do a map reduce in the end, and you will say, you know, it's basically a hash table. So you will collect, you will find how many unique IDs I have after that. So I have, you know, four, I have 11, like these are keys, 14 and 17. So I have four disconnected components. And again, you can find all the nodes that they have four. This is your first cluster, the second cluster, third cluster. That's kind of like a, a Hard graph clustering, okay. So the yarn and you build something called the graph reduce? Could do that. I would actually prefer if you could just take the Scala actors because it's JVM and just plug it in. Or Erlang, you know, I love Erlang. It's my, I know it's your love too. So. H actor is a note. Is it's a. It's actors like MPI is just to do the, the transport models. So MPI has the synchronous uh, transport layer. But you, yeah, I believe Erlang is doing that with this TP or you no. Know, Actually, depends. For example, in in GraphLab, when you're working on a on a on a single machine, on a set memory, you don't really need basically the memory don't set that that's half table that you know. Like every time you see that I need to update, you put it. I don't think you use RPC. I, if I use RPC. No. They're, they have implemented their own messaging. So for the, the factorization machine method that I use that works with linear regression and, and recommendations. Now you can implement it sequentially. You can implement it with MapReduce with whatever you want. It just happened that Danny Bixon, who works from GraphLab, made an implementation of that. It's fast. It's nice. It's sexy. It's asynchronous. And uh, we got that. Like, if you want and if you have time, you can just follow his blog post. Or you can go to Stephen Randall's website. He has a different implementation of that. I believe it's sequential. And, and use that. If you want to go to your boss and say, boss, we're having better predictions right now. We'll find better talents. You know, give me a bonus. You know, go and do that. Feel free. I mean, the, the goal over here is that, you know, we got people that they are data talent gurus. How do we? What's your title number? Whatever, scientists, statisticians, that they already have a problem and they would want a better, you know, uh, prediction system. We have people from startups that they want recommendation engines. We want we have people that they do. Uh, Monosys is also a startup, I believe, a startup or is starting up. We have Brad, who is a the big data guru slash salesman, and he wants to impress his clients. And you know, we have. Uh, Raj from Dambala and uh, Georgi, which I don't remember where he's from. Jacob, I see, okay, a lot of people joined. Uh, so anyway, uh, enjoy the break, guys. Uh, this was 
the last course from the first semester. I'll let you know, but actually I'm going to move everything from Meetup to my new website because Meetup has all these problems that we know. I'll probably keep it scheduling, but not for the material. So enjoy the break, um, eat safely, <laughs> uh, and uh, talk next year. Okay. Bye-bye.